Oh, welcome to Oak Hills Community Church. I'm glad you all joined us. <laughs> How'd you like how that halfway through the well, the microphone, microphone came on? That's kind of fun. Um, well, let's stand, and if there's anybody else out there, they'll hear us sing if we sing. So let's sing together, How Firm a Foundation. And let me put the capo on the proper fret so that the rest of the band doesn't uh, get lost. One, two, three. And shake hands with one another. I think Stuart's going to come up and give us any announcements we might have. And then y'all can have a seat as he's coming up. At least I think he is. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy Independence Day Eve. It's, huh? I don't know. It says it is. The green light's on? Okay. Yeah, somebody didn't hand it to me, so I don't know how to work this technology. <laughs> uh, first of all, just want to point out, we've got these cute little cards right out here by, in the little hallway by the offering plate. These are some uh, neat cards that has our church information on it. It's got a wood background. Get it? Oak Hills Community Church, wood background. And it's got our worship time and our Sunday school time, our address. On the back, it has our small groups, times and addresses and phone numbers. And just put one of these in your pocket, your purse, your wallet, and invite somebody to come to worship with us. 
That's what it, they're for. We can always order more, so grab you two or three. And if you got folks that look a little lost or a little down or just have questions, they're welcome here, right? We would love to meet and talk with anybody. Any, everybody is welcome at church. So this week, uh, next coming Wednesday, we have Kids Lego Night. Again, if you like kids or if you like to play with Legos or if you like both, come on up here. Uh, on Wednesday and help out uh, and watch the kids put together Legos. They usually do a Bible scene, uh, and that'll be kind of fun. Um, we had a great time last yesterday at Sweet House of Prayer. We uh, came up here and prayed for an hour, had good fellowship, and thank you to everybody who came to the house yesterday for the, the barbecue. That was fun. We had a lot of people who uh, didn't know anybody <laughs> came into the house. And Todd, I think, won the uh, surprise of the day when he brought six Mormons uh, to come and visit and fellowship with us and eat food and, and just uh, expose folks to Christ's love and to Christ's church. Thank you very much. Uh, last thing, we have uh, the next Sweet House of Prayer will be August 6th. Mark your calendar. 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. We have coffee, uh, and it's a time where we pray for our church, pray for our family, and you bring your own prayer needs. You know, what can we pray for together for you and your family? And that's about it. So, God bless you all. Thank you for coming, and let's worship some more. All right. Let's uh, stand together. We're going to sing <clears throat> a song that I can't read the name of. <laughs> oh, praise the name. So the, so on this tablet, it's really cool, right, the, what we use for, for the, the charts. I can have a metronome come down over the top of the page, but then it blocks the title of the song. So if I don't remember what the song is, I'm up a creek unless somebody helps me. It's called Oh, Praise the Name. <clears throat> One, two, three. my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree.
Thank you for singing. That was wonderful. Would you all have a seat? And Tip, we're going to mix it up a little bit today because it is Fourth of July weekend. Um, Mark's, Mark Hawkins is going to come up here in just a little bit and pray for our nation. But right before Michelle comes up and prays for the body, I wanted to read uh, Ephesians, <clears throat> excuse me, Ephesians 6, verse 18. It says, pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. That's kind of a command. So that's why during our services, we take time to pray for the, the needs that we're aware of. We also send those out. If you are not getting those emails uh, for prayer requests and you would like to get them, um, let me know. Send me an email. I, I, I can't read everybody's handwriting because some of you have really pretty handwriting and it's hard to read. Um, but send me an email. I think my email address is still in the bulletin. Double check that. If it's not, just come to me and I'll, I'll get it to you. Um, and then I'll get you on that prayer request list and you'll receive those emails if you're not getting them currently. Michelle, would you come and at this time pray for the needs that, that we know of? Good morning. We will uh, start today with a praise. So uh, Beth Ann Emery and Kevin Hammond were married yesterday. A great celebration of the Lord. Yes. We praise God for bringing them together. And, and we do uh, pray for Dick and Kathy to have a safe, safe trip home. Uh, but I saw pictures and it was, it was wonderful. And we'll have the opportunity to celebrate in person with Beth Ann and Kevin on August 7th. So there'll be more news about that reception. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we do praise your holy name. We thank you for your grace and mercy that we need every day. Father, we thank you for the love that you've bestowed on us through Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and was resurrected that we may live in eternity with him. What an amazing miracle. What an amazing gift. Father, it is beyond what we can understand your awesome power, your mighty love and faithfulness. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. We praise you that you brought Beth Ann and Kevin together. We celebrate with them in their marriage that it would be based on the foundation of Christ. And we look forward to, to seeing them as a married couple and sharing that joy that you've brought into their lives. Father, please bring Dick and Kathy home safe from the wedding, and we look forward to celebrating with them as well at the reception on August 7th. Father, we lift up Zach, Kelly, Jordan, Ezekiel, and Ryan as they continue to get established with doctors for Ryan's care here in the United States. We pray for a teaching job for Zach and that your great provision would be in their lives that they would acknowledge all you have done to bring them here safely, bring them back together with family. And Father, you would continue to show great favor and blessing on this family. Father, we lift up all who are sick, recovering from illness or surgery, especially little Grayson as he's going through his maintenance leukemia treatments. We pray that he would be healed and fully recovered very soon and not need any treatments. And Father, we pray for his family. There's much caregiving going on with Grayson and his siblings and with his great-grandmother. Please bring everyone in his family the energy and refreshment they need to have the joy in their hearts that only you can bring and that they would just rejoice in the many blessings that you've bestowed on the family. Father, we lift up Kelly. We ask for relief from her shoulder pain, that she would have more mobility in her shoulder. Father, help her to be able to rest and to fully heal. Father, we lift up Kathy. We pray for answers on her diagnosis and treatments for breathing issues. Please continue to take her to the specialists to, uh, to get her the care and the, the treatment that she needs to feel better. Father, we lift up Dr. Carol. We ask for full healing from her back surgery. We pray that she is stronger every day. Father, we lift up Mary. We are so 
pleased, so wonderfully amazed at your work in her since her back surgery. She is back here with us worshiping, and we pray for continued good progress as she feels better every day. And Father, we lift up Duke and pray for good test results and treatments as he's in Arizona for his cancer treatment this week. We pray for travel mercies for he and Mary and that they would feel your constant encouragement through this time. Father, please be with Esther and give her encouragement as she comforts and cares for her family who's grieving the loss of her cousin's husband. Please give her safe travels home that she would be back with us soon. And Father, please lift Maria's spirit. Help her to not feel alone in this time. Bring her strength and encouragement through the difficulties she is facing with co-parenting decisions and caring for her children. Remove any anxiety or fear from her. Help her to feel your presence as she takes one step forward each day. And Father, we pray for Todd, who will be going on a mission trip to Africa in September. We pray that you would provide the finances, the means, that you would lead Todd, prepare his heart, prepare the hearts of those that he will be working with in Africa, and just bless this trip all to your glory. Father, we also lift up our missionaries in Moldova. We know that they have been working hard to take care of refugees from Ukraine. We also pray for their own uh, physical health, Lord, uh, for Elixay's eyes that you would heal his eyes, that his vision would return. And Father, encourage their hearts, keep them uh, close to you, that they would continue the good work you've given them. And Father, we thank you for Oak Hills Ministries, working in our children's ministry, discipleship classes, evangelism and small groups. Father, please use us to serve your kingdom, to share the gospel, to bring us those opportunities to reach hearts, to plant seeds, that you would transform people's hearts and minds. And Father, we pray for EFCA churches to stand strong on your word, to constantly teach the truth in love, and to encourage those who are hurting, lost, and in need. Father, we thank you for these many blessings, especially the fellowship that we have here at Oak Hills, the love that we share with each other and in our community. Please continue to use us to your good purpose. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Michelle. The year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Back in the old days, the longer and more decorated the king's robe was, the more important people thought he was. The difference here is, God is, right? He is worthy of all worship and honor and glory. The train of his robe filled the temple, as did his glory. We're going to sing that right now. So if you'd stand up and kind of put yourself in the temple of God where Isaiah was in his vision, seeing the Lord. Dream. 
holy and us singing how we have doesn't even come close to what you're worthy of in receiving in honor and glory and praise but father we pray that you have received just a little bit at least from us of and father we pray that as we continue to worship you this morning that we we hear and and learn from pastor mark uh, your words that we might become more like jesus and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. Mark is going to come up and lead us in a prayer for our nation. Well, good morning, everybody. I would like to read a little section of scripture before we go into prayer. This is in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4. These are instructions that Paul wrote to Timothy. And uh, not only was it instructional for Timothy, I believe it's also instructional for us. So we need to follow these words as well. Paul says, first of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, in order that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all, godly, in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So what Paul's instructing us to do here is pray for our leadership, the leadership of the country. So uh, let's do that now. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, uh, as we enter this season of celebration of the birth of this nation, First of all, we thank you that we have this country, that we have this nation where we can gather together like this in peace uh, without fear of any interference from the government. And uh, Father, for that, there are many, many countries, many, many Christians around the world that do not have that freedom. So we thank you for that. Father, this country was founded on principles that are found in your word and uh, for that we are thankful and uh, Father we at this point want to ask for your forgiveness for turning away from those 
which is what's been going on for the last several years. So in that regard, I ask that you reach the people who are in leadership in this country, that uh, you use whatever means you need to to cause them to realize the direction that they're going and that they need to turn around and go a different direction, a direction towards you. So I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mark, for praying. It's good to lift up our leaders in prayer, isn't it? Dear brothers and sisters, a friend is a precious gift. A friend is a gift from God. When times are good, somebody we can be with, we can rejoice with and enjoy their company. When times are challenging, a friend that can come alongside us and support us. Somebody can show up with a truck when... Uh, Things break down and they're willing to come and pick up whatever is needed. A friend is important. It, kids need a friend, right? Kids want a friend. Yeah, yeah, they do. Teenagers want a friend. But all of us need a friend. A friend or two that can help us is a blessing from God. Your friend might be um, somebody that you met in class at school. Your friend might be your spouse. Your friend might be somebody that you've known since childhood. Your friend might be someone who uh, is uh, a sibling. Sometimes your best friend is a sibling. Whoever that friend is, they can give us encouragement and be a blessing to us. Friends are a gift, a gift from God. And we know this because of the way that the Bible describes friendship. I want to show a couple of Proverbs to you to give you some indication of that. Think of Proverbs 17, verses 17 and 18. It says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. I know sometimes we think of brothers as being uh, the cause of adversity, but I wanted to double check this, and so I went to a person I consider an authority on Old Testament scripture, Hebrew scripture, Bruce Waltke. And he says that here the idea is that a brother is born to help in times of adversity, to be there those special times when we really need somebody. But a friend, a true friend, is not just there during times of difficulty. <clears throat> a true friend is there to enjoy life with, somebody that you share similar interests in, some, somebody that you just are encouraged to be around, and they're encouraged to be around you. Or think of Proverbs 18.24. <clears throat> a man of many companions comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, sometimes there is somebody we might call a false friend, somebody who is there and they'll pretend to be your friend, but they really aren't. Just imagine, if you will, picture yourself and you, you go down to the local um, gas station and you decide, well, I never do this, but I'm going to buy one ticket to the lottery. By the way, you know, some people are going and buying hundreds of tickets. Don't do that. <laughs> but say you did buy one ticket and you won the lottery. You know what's going to happen? All of a sudden, you're going to have a lot of friends. <laughs> and those friends will be there until the money runs out. They're not true friends. But there is a friend who is true. And that's what the Bible describes. That's what we want, isn't it? We want to enjoy that friendship. It's a gift from God. Well, today we are going to look at true friendship, and we're going to see as we open our Bibles 
that true friendship is something that is a wonderful experience. It's something that we see in our text today, which is 1 Samuel 18. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to look there. We're not going to have the words on the screen. I encourage you to look at your Bibles. If you have your phone, feel free to look at that. What we're going to see in 1 Samuel 18 is one of the greatest friendships ever described. It's the friendship between Jonathan and David. This was a committed, lasting friendship, firstly because this was a friendship with a solid basis. This was built on their common faith and belief in God, their commitment to him. As we look at these chapters, we should remember that the purpose is not really to teach us about friendship. That's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is God is describing here what he wants to do in the history of the people of Israel. He's got a plan for his people. They asked for a king. He gave them Saul. And for a while, he was a good king. And then he turned south. But God wants to bless his people with a better king. And so he intends to give them a young shepherd boy who has the right kind of heart to be a good king. He's going to give them David. And so his plan is to reveal this. But in describing how he moves his plan forward, we see a great friendship develop. It begins with David going out and courageously taking on the giant who is challenging the people of Israel. And David conquers him, defeats him in battle. It's a great day for David. It's also a great day for Saul. You know, he's been challenged by this giant. Send me somebody to fight. And everybody's looking at Saul, and Saul's thinking, I don't want any part of this guy. Well, David steps up, and he fights. And to surprise for many, he wins the battle. The giant is dead at the hand of David. And this leads to a rout because all the Philistines were behind Goliath and they think, we've got our champion. Well, when he's gone, they don't want anything to do with anyone that can beat him. So they're in Israelite territory and they hightail it back towards where they came from, Philistia. They go back to their cities with Israel, the soldiers of Israel, in hot pursuit and killing them as they go back, killing the invading army until they reach the gates of their cities. Well, chapter 18 does not focus so much on David as it does upon Saul and Jonathan and Michael. We might say that this chapter focuses on the family, the family of Saul. It begins with Jonathan's love for David and his commitment to him, and it ends with Michael's love for David. All through, we learn of Saul's growing fear and animosity toward David, who became his son-in-law as well as his superior. We'll begin with David's new ally, Jonathan pick up in the text in chapter 18. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. Now, I'm sure as Jonathan watched David go out and conquer this giant, he admired him, but it's really the conversation that he has with his father. Apparently, Jonathan is listening, and there's something about this conversation that just wins Jonathan over. We're not quite sure what it was. Was it David's faith in God? Was it David's commitment to God? Was it David's humble spirit before God? Was it David's love for the people of God? Maybe all of these things. Jonathan listens to him and looks at him, and his heart is knit together with him. 
He has admiration for this guy. He wants to be his friend. Now look at verse 2. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant, a contract between two people that know each other with David because he loved him as himself. Have you ever had someone that you would do anything for? You know, if, if they need you to, to stop what you're doing and go help them, you'll do it. If they need money and you've got it, you'll give it to them. Whatever they need, if you have that resource, it's theirs. That kind of friendship. I have a neighbor. His name is Rick. He's that kind of guy. If I have a need, he'll drop everything and come help me out. If I need a ride, my car is broken, he'll stop everything he's doing. He'll take me. He's that kind of friend. Now, I got to tell you, I'm not always that kind of guy. But I would reciprocate with him. Well, that's Jonathan. On the one hand, God has given Jonathan a friend, a brother who he felt at one with, a brother who shared his heart. On the other hand, he had the potential to be king if he played his cards right, if he didn't make his daddy mad, if he had the right kind of friends. But what he does next, he is willing to give up even that opportunity for sake of friendship. Verse 4, look what Jonathan does. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Jonathan seems to recognize that David is the one that God wants to be king. He recognizes that God has made this choice. And he is willing to give up his right as crown prince and hand this over to young David. I believe that that Deferring to God's choice is symbolized by him giving up his clothes and his weapons. You know, in many places in Scripture, we see clothing as being symbolic. Um, Joseph was given a coat of many colors, a varied colored coat, an ornate, ornate coat made by his own father. Now, he had 12 sons. He didn't make 12 coats. He only made this one And it seemed to symbolize his favored status. The brothers all recognized this and they became jealous. But it was a symbol of favored status. When uh, Aaron died, he was the high priest. His priestly garments were removed to be worn by his son Eleazar. You didn't bury him in his priestly clothes. He was high priest. That was his office. And to symbolize the transfer of the high priesthood to his son, his clothes were taken and given to him. The same thing with Elijah. Elijah took his mantle, a piece of cloth, a covering, and he put it over Elisha, his young protege, who God had chosen to be the next person to occupy the office that Elijah had, the office of prophet. In all these cases, we see clothing is symbolizing something of a transfer, something of authority, something given to demonstrate who the person is. In a footnote from his book, Looking on the Heart, Dale Ralph Davis refers to an Akkadian document from a 13th century B.C. in which a king and his wife are divorcing. And this document speaks to the situation of the crown prince, the son. 
And he said, the son can either go to live with the father or the mother. But if he chooses to go live with the mother, his mother, he gives up his right to the throne. To symbolize this, he would take off his, his clothing and he would leave it on the throne, showing that he was giving up his right. And I believe that's what Jonathan is doing. He is giving up his right to the throne by taking his robe, his cloak, his sword, and his bow and giving that to David. He will be the king. And in giving the weapons, he will be the next commander-in-chief. Jonathan recognizes God's choice. Many of us, I think, would resist, but not Jonathan. He views David as his friend, and he willingly gives that. Now, let's contrast Saul's response to David. We'll begin with verse 5. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all his troops and Saul's officers as well. Now, they have a, a dangerous situation here if they are too hearty in their lavish praise for David. That could stir up the jealousy of Saul, their commander. They've seen that before. But in everything that David does, he succeeds. And the officers are pleased with him. You might say David has the Midas touch. Everything he touches succeeds and prospers. Verse 6. When the men were turning, returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang. Saul has slain his thousands. And David, his tens of thousands. Now, the first thing we may want to do is ask, is that really true? And I think this is a song. This is, these are lyrics. It's kind of like poetry. There may be some poetic license here. That's possible. But I think, in essence, this is true. You think about Saul. He'd slain his thousands. Well, he had gone to battle. He'd taken his troops out and passed battles. In earlier chapters, we saw this. But on one occasion, when the invading army coming into Israel had been met by Saul's forces, Saul began to win. But he told his troops, you are not to eat anything until I have taken my revenge on my enemies. Well, think about that. These guys are fighting with swords, you know, not just a light sword, but a heavy sword. It takes energy. It takes strength to wield that. And they've got their, their heavy weaponry, um, shields, and they have to weld that and, and, and be able to fight very physical battle. So it takes strength to be able to do that for the whole day, doesn't it? When you get some downtime, you want to be able to grab a quick bite to eat, to renew you, to give you more energy, to be able to sustain you in the battle. And yet Saul has forbid anyone from even tasting a morsel. Was that wise? No, as a result of that, even Jonathan observed, my father was foolish in this. The victory would have been much greater if he hadn't commanded that. In contrast, David, had defeated the mightiest warrior of the day, Goliath. And as a result, the Philistines were retreating out of Israel, and Israel's army was pursuing them and pursued them and striking them down all the way to their country. His victory was great in comparison with Saul. Well, what do you think that did for Saul? Look at this, verse 8. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. 
What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Here is a man who has been told that the kingdom is going to be taken away from him. And right now, he's thinking he has a pretty good idea of who's going to replace him. So he feels jealousy towards David. Well, look at Saul's attempt to get rid of David as a result. Verse 10. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. David, one stone against Goliath, strikes him in the forehead, dead. Saul misses David with a spear in close quarters twice. Well, we all know that Saul had some really bad days brought about by this evil spirit, which was from the Lord. David is hired as a part-time musician to play the harp for Saul to give him relief, and some, some relief does come. But David is now a full-time employee in Saul's army, and as part of his duties, he continues to play the harp when Saul is troubled. The trouble with Saul's troubles is that David has become his biggest problem, at least in his mind. Saul's jealousy turns to murder. When he fails, he changes strategies. He sends David out to the Philistine front. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. Saul appears to show kindness to David, while in reality he is just seeking to get rid of him. If the Philistines or some army doesn't kill David, at least he'll be out of sight, out in the battlefield, and then Israel won't be singing his praises. But even that doesn't work. The more David does, the more victories he has, the more popular he becomes, and the more of a threat to Saul. There are two words you need to keep in mind when you think about Saul. They are almost, but not quite, identical. One word is the word jealousy, and the other word is the word envy. You look them up in a dictionary, they're close in definition, but not quite the same. Jealousy is the fear that you will lose something valuable to you. Envy is the anger you feel when someone else gets what you wanted. Jealousy is fear, envy is anger. And they often accompany each other. Usually jealousy is first, and then envy follows after. And we see that in the life of Saul. Saul becomes jealous. He has the kingship, and he wants to pass it on to his family line. He wants to keep that for himself, and he's jealous to guard it. He's fearful of losing that, and David is a threat. And then there's envy. Envy of David, who has gone out and fought the Lord's battles, and has won in every case, and has become popular with the people. And Saul is envious of the high reputation that David has. They're both there together. There's a story told of two shopkeepers. 
They were across the street from each other, and they had a rivalry that was bitter. You know, if a person came into one shop, the other shopkeeper would look with glee over at the other shopkeeper, kind of triumphant. Hey, I got the customer and you didn't. And this rivalry went on for years. One day, an angel came to one of the shopkeepers, and he said, the Lord has sent me to teach you a lesson. The Lord is going to give you anything you want. If you want fame, it will be yours. Only your rival will get twice as much. If you want a long life, ask for it, and it will be yours. You'll have a long and happy life. But your rival will get twice as much. If you want wealth, ask for it. It will be yours, but your rival will will get twice as much. Well, this embittered the shopkeeper. He thought, what am I going to do? And he thought long and hard. Finally, he said, I've got it. Here's my request. Strike me blind in one eye. (laughs) That's bitterness and jealousy. That's what it does. No wonder Shakespeare called jealousy the green-eyed monster. No wonder Dryden called envy the jauntice of the soul. As one pastor said, taken together, they are the most corroding of all vices, coals that come hissing hot from hell. But David and Jonathan do not know that Saul is planning to murder David. They see it as a fit brought on by the evil spirit. I can hear Saul's servants excuse Saul's behavior. You've just got to forgive Saul. He's he's just not himself today. And yet he is himself. He is planning to murder David. And he tries to carry it out with a spear. But when that fails... He comes up with an alternative. Saul plans to use his family as a weapon. Verse 17, Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter, Mirab. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. Now, what had Saul promised to the person who would defeat Goliath? One of the promises was his daughter's hand in marriage. So this should be just a gift, right? Well, it seems like he's forgotten all about that promise. He says, you can have my daughter Mirab if you fight valiantly against my enemies hoping that the Philistines will do him in. He's going to use his daughter in that relationship to try to get what he wants. Verse 18. But David said to Saul, Who am I? And what is my family or my clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? So when the time came for Mirab, Saul's daughter, to be given to David... She was given in marriage to Adriel. David is truly this humble man, and he doesn't feel like his station in life is high enough, and so he declines the offer. And when the time expires, she's given to another. Greatly disappointed, Saul is sure that if he can get David interested in at least one of his daughters, he can finally get victory over David. When Saul hears that his younger daughter, Michael, is deeply in love with David, he thinks, aha, here's my chance. Saul ordered his attendants, verse 22, speak to David privately and say, look, the king likes you and his attendants all love you. Now become his son-in-law. They repeated these words to David, but David said, do you think it's a small matter 
to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man and little known. When Saul's servants told him what David said, Saul replied, Say to David, The king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. When the attendants told David these things, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. So before the allotted time elapsed, David took his men with him and went out and killed 200 Philistines. Then Saul gave his daughter Michael in marriage. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. This chapter opens up with his son pledging and committing to David, loving David as a friend and making a commitment to David. The chapter ends with his daughter, Michael, also loving David and making a covenant in marriage to him. With all of Saul's ability as king and all his plotting, he has failed and two of his children are now in love and friendship and commitment and in covenant with the guy he is trying to kill. Truly, Saul has failed, and his kingdom is unraveling. Chapter 18 does not focus on David as much as it does on Saul, Jonathan, and Michael. We might say this chapter focuses on the family of Saul. It is most, in a most unusual and unexpected way, God is bringing to pass things he purposed and promised. David is on his way up, and Saul on his way down. It's not the way we expected it, but then very often, the way God brings about his purposes are not the way we would expect have three applications, and these are from Bob Deffenbaugh. In Jonathan, we see a most excellent illustration of the love which God requires of us. We are repeatedly instructed to love our neighbor as ourself. This is precisely how Jonathan treats David. Jonathan is an example to us of how we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Second, we see in Saul what we see in our Lord's disciples. Remember what they were doing? They were fighting with one another, even on the night before he is to be crucified. They're struggling. They're trying to say, you know, I, I want to be great in your kingdom, or they're plotting ways to get Christ to commit to who's going to be number one, number two, brother one and brother two. And when one gets ahead of the other, the disciples begin to fight amongst one another. Pretty amazing. But you know what? That's the same thing we see in the church all too often. Three things. Competition, jealousy, and self-will. God has given each of us, brothers and sisters, a gift, a spiritual gift, or maybe more than one, to be used by him or her who's received that gift to build up the body of Christ. God gives us an ability. Whatever that gift is, I think there are about 19 spiritual gifts listed in the New Testament. Whatever that spiritual gift that this Christian or that Christian has been given, they excel in. As they develop that gift, they become very good at building up the body of Christ. But some people see that ability and they get jealous or they have envy. And we see fighting take place. You know, it's just possible that 
Some of the fights we see in church are not over spiritual things at all. Not over things we might think about like doctrine or duty, but are really just people trying to carve out their own place for their own sake and own reputation. That's the kind of attitude we see in Saul. He didn't care about people. He didn't care about his country. He only cared about himself. So beware of jealousy in the church. Last, God has appointed his son, Jesus Christ, to establish the kingdom of God and rule over every creature on this earth. And he is coming. His reign is future. He will come. He will do that. Like Saul, we can seek to prolong our own reign and resist the inevitable reign of God's king. If we do, we do so to our own destruction. Or we can relinquish any thought of reigning and submit to God's king, submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, as Jonathan submitted to David. The only right choice is to relinquish any thought of attempting to maintain control and authority over our own lives and to submit to him who alone is qualified to reign. These are the only two choices that God has given us. To fail to take Christ seriously is to reject his rule. To resist Christ's reign is to bring judgment upon ourselves. Which will we choose? There's only one good choice there, friends. The choice to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. All who name the name of Christ, all who believe in Christ, God gives us the opportunity to serve his his son. Let's do that. Pray with me. Father God, We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the rightful king, the righteous king, the servant king, Jesus, who loves us, gave his life as a sacrifice for us. We thank you for the gift of eternal life that he offers because he died for all of our sins and rose again for our justification. Father, Once we believe that, once we receive Christ as our Savior, we have two choices, to serve ourselves or to serve him. I pray, Father, believing that the very best course for each of us is to serve Christ. I pray you would help us to make that choice, to to commit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. And before I turn it over to the music team, I want to add one last thing. As looking at this, I thought we haven't really talked about our purpose for the church in a long time. Probably very few would remember what our purpose statement is. Many years ago, the elders got together and said, we need to condense our purpose statement because we had six plaques on the wall, six paragraphs And nobody could remember that. So the elders boil it down to nine words, something that could be remembered. So here is the purpose statement. We glorify God by making disciples of all people. The focus is upward. It's not self. We glorify him. And how do we do that? By obeying what Christ said to his disciples as he was about to leave them. Go and make disciples of all people. Would you say that with me? We glorify God by making disciples of all people. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Would you all stand with us? We're going to sing God of Wonders.
of all creation, of water, earth, and sky. Heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. benediction today, probably the shortest benediction I've ever had, is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Amen. Be blessed.